We began to establish why the book of Ephesians is called the scriptures. We said that the book of Ephesians, before it was added into the latest called the scriptures, we had what we call the Old Testament as the scriptures. The Old Testament, which is Genesis to Malachi, was referred to as the scriptures. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration. The word inspiration means the breath. So all scriptures came out of the breath of God. And they are profitable, number one, for doctrine. Number two, for, for reproof. Number three, for correction. Number four, for instructions in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work so the scriptures are given to us you know the the old testament books we can use the old testament books to teach to correct and to instruct that's what paul was trying to communicate to timothy and the reason is simply because second peter chapter 1 verse 19 we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts next verse Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. No prophecy of the scripture is personalized. That's what it means by private interpretation. Where somebody will say, me, this is what God is telling me. I don't know what the Bible is saying, but God is telling me this. No prophecy, except it's not from the scriptures. And if it's not from the scripture, it's not from God. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation are we together here yeah so that means the interpretation of the scripture is one and the same to everyone a friend of mine was telling me that uh, one of his aunts said to him if what christians are preaching is divine it should be the same everywhere if it is divine because a divine message is the same truth has one quality consistency Lies have one quality, inconsistency. If what is preached is the truth, it should be the same thing preached everywhere. And if it is not the same thing preached everywhere, then it means some people are not preaching the truth. Because if it is the truth, it will have a quality of consistency. I don't know if we're talking. That's why it says no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Nobody will say, well, my own understanding. There is no my own understanding. Uh, somebody will say, the way I see it, there is no way you see it. It should be the same way it was written that it is meant to be seen. Are we together here? In fact, put up the next verse, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Nobody just stood up and said, well, thus say of the Lord. In the New Testament, we prophesy by our will. But in the Old Testament, in the writing of the books called the scripture, it was not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. By the Holy Ghost. And the entire document called scripture maintains a consistency. And we shall look at the consistency in a few seconds. Now, just before we get into consistency, Jesus and the apostles agreed that the scriptures is inspired by God. Both Jesus and the apostles. How do we know that? Jesus quoted from Moses. He quoted from Exodus. He quoted from Genesis. He quoted from Deuteronomy. Why? He was giving authenticity to the Old Testament. He quoted from Isaiah. He quoted from all the books of the Old Testament called the scripture. So he authenticated the scripture. The apostles drew out all of their instructions, all of their teachings, and all of their inspirations from the scriptures. So the apostles authenticated the scriptures. Are we together here? So the scriptures, therefore, are inspired by God. Now, in First Peter chapter 1, verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and such diligently who prophesied of the grace that shall come unto you. Next verse. Such in what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them. The prophets prophesied by the spirit of Christ. And what did the spirit of Christ prophesy through them? It prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. The spirit of Christ is also called the spirit of God. Is also called the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing. It is also called the spirit of adoption. The difference is in its contextual usage. Depending on which context it was being used. But it is the same thing. Are we together here? The variation there is because of context. 
That's why sometimes it's called the spirit of Christ, sometimes the spirit of God, sometimes the spirit of adoption, sometimes the spirit of his son, or the Holy Spirit, depending on the context where it is being used. Now, that word, the spirit of Christ, or the Holy Spirit, is actually used for identification. Romans 8.15 for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That's identification with Christ. The same spirit in Christ crying, Abba, Father, is the same spirit in us crying, Abba, Father. Identification. Another scripture, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God, led by the spirit of God. All right? Now, verse 16. The spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Are you understanding? So it's the same thing just depending on the usage within the context in which it is communicated. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 calls it the spirit of his son. And because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Crying, Abba Father, the spirit of his son. Romans 8, 9 is called the spirit of Christ. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you. So you see, the spirit of Christ is Christ. Because he called him the spirit of Christ in verse 9. Then in verse 10, now says, if Christ be in you. See, contextual usage is where the coinages are different. In the context in which it is used. And then verse 11 says, If the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. By his spirit that dwelleth in you. Same spirit in Christ, same spirit in me. Are we together here? Yeah. So it depends in what it is used for. In, in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and 2, it is called the spirit of life. It's the same thing. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The spirit of life, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of his son, the Holy Spirit. All of it is the same thing, but the, the difference in the usage is context that makes the difference. Are we together here? It's like some years ago, I went somewhere to preach and I said, nobody raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus rose by himself. The following year, I went back to the same church and I said, well, Jesus was raised up by the spirit of the father. By the glory of the father. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead. So after the service, the pastor came to my hotel and said, now I'm confused. And I said, what's confusing you? He said, last year you came to our church and you said nobody raised Christ from the dead. Now you have come back to say that God raised Jesus from the dead. And now you said, the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Then I said to him, in fact, there's another one. Jesus is raised by the glory of the Father. So he started laughing and he said, please don't confuse me more. I said, no, you see, when we teach scriptures, we teach them in context. So if you do not follow contextual understanding, you will get confused. Because the spirit that raised Christ from the dead is Jesus himself. Okay? It is a, Jesus himself is the glory of the Father. Jesus himself is the spirit of resurrection. Didn't he say, I am the? Exactly. But the variation in application is dependent on context. So in Bible study, context is king. Don't play with context. Because if you play with context, you will abuse scripture by making scripture say what scriptures are not saying. First Peter 1 Peter 1.10 Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. That was the context and the content of their prophecy. That grace was going to come unto you. They prophesied of the grace that was going to come unto you. Can I hear your amen? Next verse, such a word or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them or on them rather, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. The spirit of Christ is the Holy Ghost. Holy men speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, said they what this they speak. Now, what speak through them? The spirit of Christ. Same thing. 
the spirit of Christ which was on them did testify. What was the testimony of the spirit of Christ? That is what is written in the scriptures. It is called the prophetic scriptures. All right. Now follow me. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is where? In Christ Jesus. You've known the holy scriptures. It makes you wise unto salvation. Which salvation? Salvation that comes through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Revelation 19.10 and I fell down at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? Prophecy. So the spirit of Christ that was in them had just one testimony, and that was the testimony of Jesus, which testified beforehand. Testimony of Jesus. What was the testimony beforehand? The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. That's the testimony of Jesus. And that is the spirit of the scriptures. Which scriptures? The scriptures of the prophets. Praise the Lord. Is it getting clear? Now, please take note. The Old Testament books were prophetic. They were prophetic books. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world begun. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets. Why is it called the scriptures of the prophets? The prophets prophesied what was documented in the scriptures. So the scriptures are prophetic scriptures because they foretold what Christ will do before he came. So everything Jesus did was according as it was prophesied. So everything that happened was prophetic. So the prophets were foretelling what will happen. That Jesus will come to fulfill. So that's why the entire Old Testament is prophetic because they were foretelling what will happen when Jesus comes? Are we together here? Yeah. Luke 24, 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All that the prophets, the scriptures of the prophets. What have the prophets spoken? Next verse. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. The spirit of Christ which was in them did testify see it did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of christ now he began to tell them all that the prophets have spoken what have the prophets spoken that christ ought to suffer and out of his suffering glory will follow now please take note he didn't say all prophets have said all that the prophets so there were a class of prophets he's talking about he's not talking about general prophets all that the prophets, definite, specific. Amen. All that the prophets, referring to the prophets of the Old Testament. Praise the Lord. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. That's why those books are scriptures, because Jesus authenticated by teaching from them. And when he taught from them, he said, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning him. So the centerpiece of the scriptures is Christ. The centerpiece, the message of the scriptures is Christ. That is what makes them scriptures. Because the central theme of the scriptures, Genesis to Malachi, is Christ. Amen. And we've said the Old Testament is Jesus concealed and the new testament is jesus revealed so we said the old testament is the new testament concealed and the new testament is the old testament revealed see that john 5 39 didn't jesus say search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are there which word they testify of me they are my testimony the scriptures are my testimony the scriptures be a witness of me I am the message of the scriptures, or rather the scriptures are my testimonial. The mission of the scriptures is to build up the evidence concerning me. 
because when i come i am going to live according to the scriptures so the scriptures foretell the events that will that will culminate in my sufferings and the events that will culminate in the glory that will come out of my sufferings praise the lord it's beautiful isn't it so the old testament from genesis to malachi reveal jesus they foretell jesus what makes them authentic also is that they carry the truth about jesus which jesus will come to fulfill and those truths were carried before jesus came they didn't prophesy because they saw jesus they prophesied without knowing that there's anybody called jesus the prophets of the old testament david was in a cave and when he was in the cave in the midst of situations, he began to cry out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And God used that as that situation to bring out a, a messianic prophecy in the Psalm of David. That David thought he was talking about being abandoned in a cave, but God used the circumstances to reveal what was going to happen to Christ on the cross. So that pronouncement by David in that circumstance carried within it a messianic prophecy i don't know if you understand it so scattered all over the events that happened to people in the old testament were pockets of prophecies of the messiah that they themselves were operating but didn't understand that it was prophecy they thought they were just talking about events that were happening in their time that's why the spirit of christ on them was speaking through them concerning the events but yet in the events foretelling the future. That's why they are called the prophetic scriptures. Are we together here? Yeah, because they spoke before it happened. They spoke before it happened. Hallelujah. Grace is going to come to you. What is grace coming to you? The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. So the testimony of Christ is embedded in the scriptures. The Old Testament, therefore, is known because its account, all of the Old Testament compressed together, has two sentences as the summary of its accounts. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. That's all. That's all. That's the subject. That's the heart of the Old Testament. When you remove that from the Old Testament, you don't have scriptures anymore. That's what makes his scriptures. For example, in Acts chapter 8, verse 28, returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah as the prophet. He read what? Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? You are reading the book of Isaiah, but do you understand what you're reading? That's what happens to many people today. They read the Bible, but cannot even tell what they're reading. They just look for where it looks nice. Then they claim it. You know what I mean? Anyone that looks nice, they claim it. Anyone that don't look nice, they don't claim it. You know, and uh, it's crazy what's happened in the body of Christ. It's very crazy. Just read, read, read. Anyone that looks nice, I claim it. Anyone that doesn't look nice, mm -mm. without understanding the context and without understanding the message, there are some things that will sound nice. But they are not really good. You can be claiming disaster on yourself. Because you do not understand what the book is talking about. Yes. That has been a message in many churches. All of my appointed time, I'm going to wait until my change comes. And they are happy. Oh, my change is coming. My change is coming. What they are saying is I'm going to die. Because change is dying. It's moving from this body to the other one. That's change. And if you are not taught that scripture, you keep claiming that and you die young because you wanted it. You wanted a change. You are tired of being here. You want to be on the other side. Amen? It's lack of teaching. Somebody said, well, uh, a whole church did a conference on do not remove the Asian landmarks. Do not remove the Asian landmarks. He's talking about geographical native boundaries. That you don't move them away. That's all he's talking about. There's, it has no spiritual connotation. It's just illiteracy. And many of them like that. People just take scriptures and just somebody read somewhere and began to say, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God has prepared for you. No. 
That is not a teaching for today. That is a description of the Old Testament. That the Old Testament people had it but couldn't see what they were, they were talking about. And they were prophesying but their ears were not understanding what they were talking about. But God has revealed them to us, New Testament, by the Spirit. Are we together here? It sounds nice to say, eyes have not seen. If eyes have not seen, how will you get it? Because whatever you're going to get, somebody should have, should have manufactured it. Just lack of understanding of the scriptures. Praise the Lord. So that's why study is critical. I mean, study concerning your faith is so important. And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture where he read was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. Next verse. In his humiliation, like his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? All he taken away, he who? For his life is taken from the earth. Next verse. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself? Is the prophet talking about himself or of some other man? So, Obviously, this guy is reading, but is confused now because he has not understood who the message of the scripture is. And anybody else tomorrow, next tomorrow, not even last that time, who does not understand who the message of the scripture is, when he reads this, he'll be confused. So what happened? Next verse. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached what? Unto him? Yeah, because that prophecy was a prophecy of Jesus. He preached Jesus to that man from Isaiah 53. Praise the Lord. Now, how was Philip able to teach that to that man? Because Philip had prior information. Jesus opened their understanding in Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and 45. Jesus already taught them. He already showed them the Old Testament. And he already told them that I am the message of the Old Testament. The Old Testament testifies of me. So when Philip saw this, he knew that certainly this must be Jesus. So from the same scripture where the man was confused, Philip began to share with him on the sufferings of Christ. Did you observe that that scripture was concerning the suffering of Christ? He will be humbled, he will be wounded, he will be, you know, rejected, humiliated. The sufferings of Christ. Because the text of the Old Testament is what? The sufferings of Christ and the glory that will fall. Praise the Lord. We've already seen that Genesis to Malachi is a prophetic scriptures because those books were prophesied or spoken before the actual event took place. They were spoken before, beforehand. All right. So Genesis to Malachi are the prophetic scriptures that foretell what will happen to the Messiah. Now, but Malachi to Matthew, to Mark, Luke, John, they were historic, not prophetic. What Matthew saw, what Mark saw, what Luke saw, what John saw. They wrote what had happened. So those four books are not prophetic. They are historic. They are historic books. Old Testament prophetic, it foretells what will happen. You won't see those say the Lord in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So they are not prophetic books. They were written to document or give us evidence of the fulfillment of of the incarnation of Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were given to us to document or give us evidence of the fulfillment of the incarnation of Christ. The incarnate Christ or Jesus the man. A proof that Jesus was a man. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Can you see that in all of that prophecy there, the name Jesus is not written there? Because that prophecy is Jesus concealed. Because that was just talking about Jesus. For unto us a child is born. Talking about the incarnation in prophecy. The incarnation where? In prophecy. Give me Isaiah 7 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. That's prophecy. It has not happened. 
But in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see that the angel came to the virgin and said, Hail thou Mary, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with you. The fulfillment of that which was spoken in the prophetic scriptures. After it had happened, Matthew is writing it as history. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are historic books. Genesis to Malachi are prophetic books. Are we together in the house? Yeah, very important. And I, there's a reason why I'm taking you through this journey. We'll soon get there. When Matthew wrote, Mary had already received the word. Be it unto me according to the word, and the word became flesh. So the four gospels are historical. Genesis to Malachi, inspired by the spirit to show the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. Now, Acts of the Apostles is also a historic book. The book of Acts is a historic book or historic document to show the outpouring of the spirit and how the church was going to grow in revelation. The book of Acts, you see the church growing in revelation. So therefore, we cannot establish doctrine from the book of Acts because it is also a historic book. We cannot just rely on an opinion in Acts for any opinion in the book of Acts to be taken by us as doctrine, it must have the backing of the epistles. Because Acts is a historic book. It records for us what happened on Pentecost and how the church was born and how the church began to grow and how the church transitioned from one level to another. It gave us all of the, the reports of what happened, you know, in the church of the apostles. So it's a historic book. Doctrine begins from Romans. Amen. Where does doctrine begin from? It begins from Romans. So, what about the epistles? The teachings of Paul are the teachings of Christ. Paul didn't teach anything else by himself. Everything Paul wrote was taken from the scriptures of the prophets who prophesied and testified by the spirit of Christ that was on them concerning the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Paul took it from there everything he wrote in the epistles so the epistles are the teachings of christ somebody puts it like this the gospels are the elementary teachings of christ the epistles are the advanced teachings of christ somebody put it like that they are the advanced teachings of christ so we explain to that uh, father that look father in the lord we are not exalting the teachings of Paul above the teachings of Christ. But Jesus himself placed a disclaimer on his teachings where the church is concerned. Jesus himself. He placed a disclaimer. First of all, without a parable speaking not to them. And parables are used to communicate to unbelievers. It, but to you is given to know. To them, it is not given to know. So that means parables are given are not given to unbelievers, but it is a message to unbelievers to bring them to faith in Christ. But for you, you can catch the revelation in it. So already puts a disclaimer on those teachings. Then he says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will receive of mine and he will show it to you. So the epistles is what Jesus really wanted to say that they could not bear. That he now revealed to the apostles who wrote in the epistles for us to consume. Are you understanding? Yeah. So the epistles are the advanced teachings of Christ or the epistles are the message of the church. And that is why the teachings of Paul have been accepted as scriptures even by the other apostles. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 15, look at it. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Then look at the way Peter described the teachings of Paul. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things had to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures. So the epistles are in the same class with the scriptures. They are in the same class with the scriptures. Because the epistles were brought out from the scriptures. Did I establish weeks ago that Paul didn't teach anything of his own. Everything he taught was in reference to the scriptures. And we took a lot of them and we, we compared notes and we saw that that's exactly what happened. So the epistles therefore are accepted as scriptures. Amen. I said amen. 
So let's get into these and uh, deal with something here. John chapter 14 verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Verse 2. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I've done some exegesis on this chapter already. That that place Jesus was going to prepare is not, is not a place in heaven. It's not a house in heaven. What, when he said, in my father's house are many mansions, this word mansions is the Greek word for dwelling places. In my father's house are dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. The going to prepare a place for you is not the one he went, you know, after he has finished teaching the disciples, where he went to sit down at the right hand of majesty. That going that he was saying, I'm going to go to prepare a place, was the one he went after he resurrected, before he came back. It was the first going, not the second one. I go because when he said this, he had not died. This is a pre-resurrection chapter. He had not died yet. So when he was saying, I go, remember when he rose from the dead, he told Martha, I'm going to my father, your father, my God. That I go is the going after his resurrection. Are we teaching here? So when he was saying, I go to prepare, he was talking about after I rise, I'm going to go and secure for you a dwelling place in the regency on high. Because I'm the regent. I'm going to be the regent of the regency. Up there at the right hand of majesty. I'm going to occupy the place of all authority. And when I occupy that place, I am going to take all of you to occupy the place with me. Amen. Next verse. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. This come again is where many people get confused. It doesn't mean... I will come again. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the king. That's not what he's talking about. I will come again means when I go up to the right hand of majesty and present the blood of my sacrifice. And the blood is accepted and I am inaugurated the Lord General of the church. I will come back instantly and I will raise you up to be seated where I'm seated. He wasn't talking about rapture. He was talking about what was going to happen as a result of the sufferings of Christ. Exactly. That's what he was talking about. Here. That's what he was talking about here. Next verse. Whither I go, you know, and the way you know, you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Look at verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Greater than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, I go to prepare a place for you is the same thing with I go to my Father. Are you watching? Same thing. Because it's in the same context. These thoughts were expressed in the same chapter. So he, he was talking about the same thing in the same chapter. In, the, in verse 2 and in verse 12. He was talking about going to the Father. Alright? Now, when he says, I go to my Father to prepare a place for you, he said that where I am, you may be also. I want you to be where I will be. He was dealing with identification. Now, let me ask you a question. What was he going to the father's place to do? Exactly. To do what? To prepare a place. Who is he preparing the place for? For you. And he said, I will come back and take you to myself. So that where I am, so where he is, is where? Exactly. Identification. He was not talking about after we die. No, he was talking about the reality of what his redemptive work was going to make available to us. Greater you will do, why will you do greater? Huh? Why will you do greater? Because I go to prepare a place. Who am I preparing the place for? For you. So that means 
after my resurrection, you will occupy a place you didn't occupy before. Now, if you occupy a place you didn't occupy before, is that not greater? Exactly. Greater. Actually, the works is not there in the original. It was added by translators. That is why it's in bracket. And greater than this shall you do. It's not just works. Greater everything. Because where you will be is greater than where you are. I'm teaching here. He was talking about something is about to change when I die. Something is about to change when I rise. Chapter 14 verse 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name that will I do. That the father may be glorified in the son. Anything you ask I will do it. Why will I do it? Because we'll be sitting together. I will be in you. You will be in me. We'll be sitting together. So I can't say no to you. Because you will be me, I will be you. Oh. Am I teaching here? Next verse. If he asks anything in my name, I will do. Anything you ask, I will do. Next verse. If you love me, keep my commandments. The commandments here is not ten commandments. He's talking about instructions. The instructions I'm giving you. So he was speaking about a time. And that time was after his resurrection. Hallelujah. Give me verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Right now he's with you, but when I die and rise from the dead, he will now come in you. The indwelling of the spirit. Can somebody say the spirit of God dwells in me? I dwell in him. So you can see dwelling, 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 dwelling place. Okay? You dwell in him. He dwells in you. The spirit will dwell in you. So that was the emphasis. Verse 19. Yet a little while and the world said me no more, but you see me because I live, you shall live also. The world can't see me, but you will see me. Because you will be in me, and I will be in you. Praise the Lord. So from verse 2 to 19 of John 14, he is teaching identification with him. I go, you go. Where I am, you are. The works I do, you do, and greater. In verse 20, at that day, you shall know that I in my father and ye in me and I in you. Which day? The day that I will prepare a place for you. That where I am you will be. When that day comes, you will know that I am in my father. You are in me and I am in you. Identification. Full identification. Full identification. Verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. I will unveil myself. Okay, next verse. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our. So. Watch this. Watch this. The Old Testament foretells the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. When Jesus came in the gospels, it was the fulfillment of the foretelling of the Old Testament fulfilled. So the gospel carried the historic account of the fulfillment of the incarnation of Christ. But in the gospels, Jesus began to foretell a futuristic event. The Old Testament spoke about his coming. The gospels record his arrival, which is fulfillment. But within the gospels, where there's a confirmation that he came as the scripture said, he also began to speak about another futuristic event that concerns another man. 
And that man is in him. I don't know if you are catching this now. So the Old Testament talks about Christ and his sufferings. And the Gospels document how he really came and suffered. But remember, out of his suffering, there is glory that will follow. Now, that glory that follows, part of that glory, is him talking about another man that will live in him. And he will live in that man. And him and that man will be in the same place. Where I am, there you will be. Thank you, Lord. Are you understanding? The believer will be united with the Father in Christ. The believer, that's what Jesus was talking about. The believer will be united with the Father where? In Christ. That's what Jesus was communicating in John 14. The unity that will come between us and the Father in him by his redemptive work. The unity that will come between us and him in the Father by reason of his redemptive work. And he said unto them, you can't bear that now. Even if I tell you, you won't catch it. How be it when he, the Spirit, has come, you will now understand what I am talking about when I'm talking about in my father's house. When I'm talking about where I am, you will be. When he comes, you will understand. But even if I say it now, you can't handle it because it doesn't make sense to you. Because the spirit hasn't come. Amen. That's how important you are. Praise the Lord. Somebody blessed this morning. If you are blessed, can I hear a powerful amen? I in you, and you in me, and I and you in the Father. Hallelujah. So what cannot happen to the Father cannot happen to you because you are we are in the Father. You and Jesus together. Jesus is not loved more than you, and Jesus doesn't have more than you have. You are not inferior, and Jesus is not superior. You and Jesus are sharing equal status in the Father. Where he is, you are. What he has, you have. And what he can do, you can do. Amen. Say with me, I am in him, justified. He is in me, glorified. I am in him, complete. And he is in me, complete. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. What he has, I have right now. What he can do, I can do right now. I can do all things through Christ. I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. I didn't hear your amen. amen. That's the reality Jesus began to communicate in the Gospels concerning the epistles. Are you blessed this morning? Praise the Lord. Oh my goodness, what a word, what a word, what a word. When you grow in the knowledge of who God is, doctrinally, your relationship with God becomes more effective. Bible tells us that.